There's a particular comment I hear a lot, whether that's from old acquaintances or strangers on the internet. You must be scared. Well, I always say, why? And they'll come back with a variant on the same sentiment. We know how dangerous China is, especially for Americans, especially these days. It is? Sure, I've heard the horror stories, but it's nothing I've ever noticed myself. Where I live, people see Americans as valuable. I get free meals, invitations to events, lots of people want my contact info. I'm more important here than I ever was back home. But back there, opinion of China is now at the lowest it's been in decades. 40 points underwater. Now maybe that doesn't surprise you. It's not all that hard to imagine why Americans would feel this way, not after what's been going on the last few years. But what might surprise you, and it certainly blindsided me, is that the Chinese feel the same way. According to one survey conducted by researchers at the National University of Singapore and the University of British Columbia, Vancouver, the Chinese have similarly negative opinions of the United States, lower than any country in Europe and even lower than Japan, their historical enemy. What's going on here exactly? Is this really all just a matter of politics? A lack of understanding? Is the cultural chasm between us just too vast? Maybe I'm not qualified to answer these questions. Fortunately, of my hundreds of local contacts, I found a few people willing to answer some questions. Questions about how we're different, what that means going forward, and maybe even how we can mend that gap. Learning English is not just learning the language. We also need to learn the culture behind the language. It is a country of immigrants, so it's like a multicultural country. Let's figure this out together, shall we? First, though, I should show you where I'm coming from here. Hefei, where I've lived for the last three years, is the capital of Anhui province in central China. Population, about 8 million. It's home to numerous universities, I work for one of them, along with a handful of historical sites related to the Three Kingdoms period. Notably, Hefei was the site of the Battle of Xiaoyaojin, where General Zhang Liao famously routed the Sun army with a personal army of no more than a thousand cavalry. Video game aficionados may recognize this as the Battle of Hefei from Koei's long-running Dynasty Warriors series. But that aside, Hefei is considered a second city, with few famous attractions, and very few foreigners. Let's start with something simple. Exactly how do we differ? Chinese people tend to be conserva conservative and uh, modest, sometimes inactive, while the American people are more uh, open-minded and uh, uh, confident and uh, active. Uh, Americans are very direct. They like to, uh, you like to, uh, comment on um, politics or some controversial topics very sharply and uh, directly. Um, Chinese people are always very um, reserved about this. So when we uh, look at uh, American politics, we often, uh, we often uh, keep the, our ideas to ourselves. Maybe in America you, you, you think something is very direct. We many Conflict. When I asked about differences between Chinese and American culture, a common answer was openness. This is hardly unique to my interviews. A 2016 study of Chinese and American focus groups found that the Chinese participants were highly likely to refer to Americans as open, often in reference to their takes on relationships. Uh, Chinese people uh, seldom show their feelings towards uh, the the one they love in public even in private uh, some old parents uh, also seldom say i love you to their children um, but americans 
are free to show their love, such as uh, uh, giving a hug and a kiss uh, as a greeting. Others mentioned broader values as cultural distinctions between Chinese and America. From one of my subjects who wished to remain anonymous, Chinese they do plans for uh, for like next ten years and next twenty years, but for Europeans or maybe for Westerners they just live in the moment. And um, this is the it looks like, but you know, according to like a uh, Hofstede's uh, five dimensions of the culture, it's like. It's actually about risk averse, whether or not to be risk averse. So that's, I think, that's the,、um, that's the like the core of the culture, which is different. For me, for for now, I think、um, the thing that most Westerners don't understand about China is that our center of morality is based on、um, utilitarianism, the the principle or the Morality center, the the like the core、uh, principle that guides you to do that thing is based on you want the interest to you want the benefits or you want the interest to be maximized. One thing that colors the relationship between China and the U.S. is the fact that most Chinese people have very little contact with Westerners. In 2019, the UN estimated that there were barely a million foreign-born people living in the PRC. That's fewer than one in a thousand people, one of the lowest proportions in the world. This is, of course, very small compared to the United States, which is home to the world's largest overall immigrant population. But it's also lower than Sweden and Italy and Russia. It's lower than in other historically isolationist countries, such as Japan, which has more than doubled China's immigrant population. Even the DPRK, as in North Korea, a country off limits to much of the world's populace, has a greater proportion of foreign-born people. And this is by no means restricted to the country's rural interior. For all I've heard about how cosmopolitan Shanghai is, its foreign population is less than one percent. Compared to 17% in Paris, 35% in New York, or 36% in London. Now, to understand why this might be, we need to go back and see how China interacted with foreign powers in general, and the United States in particular, down through history. While China has an extensive history of dealings with outsiders, such as Arab traders and various Asian states within their sphere of influence. Its encounters with the West tended to be much more negative, and led to the country closing itself off at various times. The most recent closure, after the establishment of the People's Republic, followed a period known as the Century of Humiliation, marked by a string of military and diplomatic failures, starting with the Opium Wars and ending with World War II. The Chinese ended this period with a long list of foreign rivals, prominent among them England, France, Russia, and Japan. The Sino-American relationship was a little more complicated. The United States was involved in the Century of Humiliation, for example, as part of a coalition formed to suppress the Boxer Rebellion. But relations were arguably more positive due to American intervention in the Chinese theater during World War II. First pictures of the famous Yankee flying tigers in China. For many months, their bullets held open the Burma Road. Beating a deadly tattoo upon the planes of Japan's air force, former Army, Navy, Marine officers, transport pilots—they're the last of the world's soldiers of fortune. Today, they're a part of America's flying forces fighting the Battle of China. But this wouldn't last very long. Just a few years after the end of the war, U.S. involvement in what is now known in China as the War to Resist American Aggression and Aid Korea put the two nations at odds once more. But despite all of this, Chinese views on foreigners are actually quite positive. A growing proportion of Chinese people have neutral to positive views on immigration, and there's little evidence to suggest that immigration is a political issue in China in the same sense that it is in the United States or United Kingdom. Simply put, Chinese people don't hold state actions against the people. In fact. Tensions aside, it's not hard to find Chinese people with positive impressions of life in the United States. And the technology, the high technology, is invented 
by the American. The United States is the most developed, the most developed economy in the world. Its ability to innovate has made a great contribution to the world. I、uh, I think everyone could get more、uh, education、um, opportunity in the. Uh, in, in in the U.S. and I think if you work hard or study hard, um, as 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 through the exam, you can go to a very, uh, uh, a very famous campus. Um, but it's not surprising to hear Chinese people reference the American higher education system. Starting in the mid 2000s, there was a sharp increase in Chinese enrollment in American universities. Hitting a record high in 2019, when there were over a third of a million Chinese students in the U.S., over a third of the international student population. This interest in overseas education has seen American, Canadian, Australian, and British universities competing for Chinese scholars. Maybe、uh, I think the the, the American have a advantage about the education is the most advanced in the world. So. Many students in in the world like to study in America. For example, my daughter, yeah. But not all Chinese people have such positive comments about the United States. When I asked Chinese strangers what they thought about the U.S., their responses could be extremely negative. But when I asked the same question of people I knew, all of whom were of above-average education and certainly knew at least one foreigner. The responses were a distinct mix of positive and negative. In any case, negative comments tended to follow a few common threads, such as criminal violence or war. In the USA, people can get guns everywhere. I mean, the private guns. I think it's very dangerous, and it maybe it make social is very it is very、uh, dangerous. I also have. Friends, friends also come from the states, or some friends they like stayed in the states for a long while, long for a long period of time, and they told me that in 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 the United States actually more like wealth dominated or money dominated. Some people like to criticize Western culture, like、uh, America. American people are、uh, corrupt. Corrupt, right? Like, like、uh, American people uh, invaded um, the, uh, the Native American people's tribes, and then. And, and, and so, is this a problem of culture? Are American and Chinese values simply too far apart? I'm not so sure. When looking at opinion polls over time, American and Chinese views of each other tend to be lukewarm. But they've never been outright negative for any significant period. Further, Chinese people, especially those who are younger and better educated, can have very positive opinions of at least some aspects of Western culture. A Pew poll taken in 2012, a time when Chinese opinion of the United States was otherwise on the decline, showed that the Chinese were increasingly open to American ideas and customs. In short, the truth on the ground is complicated, and a lot of this is clearly media-driven.、Mm, on TV,、mm, we always、uh, get information、mm, something like、um, the United States is not is not so good. The people are so bad. Something like this. Media coverage of certain events can lead to sudden, dramatic swings in opinion, and people can have a very long memory for scandal. On the U.S. side, events such as the melamine contamination scandals, the tough on China rhetoric in the 2012 presidential election, and the ongoing trade war all precipitated strong negative reaction. In China, negative perceptions tend to be driven by high-profile arrests or. Acts of violence against Chinese citizens living abroad, such as the recent murder of PhD student Fan Yiran, killed by an active shooter in Chicago. But as to what's driving this now, 
I'm not going to patronize you by asking the hypothetical question. You know what's coming next. Why do you keep calling this the Chinese virus? There are reports of dozens of incidents of bias against Chinese Americans in this country. Your own aide, Secretary Azar, says he does not use this term. He says ethnicity does not cause the virus. Why do you keep using this? A lot of people say it's China. racist. It's not racist at all, no, not at all. It comes from China. That's why. It comes from China. I you want to be accurate. In 2020, public opinion towards China plummeted in a range of countries, a drop precipitated by the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. This led to hostile views of Chinese leadership, but it didn't stop there. In many countries, people of Chinese or other Asian descent reported increased levels of harassment from people who suddenly found them suspicious. And so we were standing there preparing for live shots this morning, just hours ago, and a man walked up and used a racial slur, slung it right at me. And I was but what about China? What was the reaction to the pandemic here? There certainly have been negative views of other countries, the United States in particular, but in my experience, it's less angry or hostile than confused. There's a particular question I receive a lot in day-to-day -day life, one that also kept coming up in my interviews. When the epidemic is an outbreak and a widespread in the Western country, they still don't want to wear masks. Uh, in America, um, they are so, how to say, they want to, they want to be free, they want to be free. They don't wear wearing masks. Uh, I don't understand. That is also where I don't understand. Yeah, why? Why, why, why foreigners, not Americans, they, they, they are not good at masks, seriously, right? Why? <laughs> why? The question, why do Americans refuse to wear masks, remains a common search term on China's Baidu even in 2021. This specific image of Americans refusing to wear masks is in part a media narrative driven by high-profile cases and reactions by public officials. In reality, while mask use rates are lower in the United States than in Asia, they're actually higher than in many Western countries. Even so, there is no question that the pandemic hit the United States especially hard. So, uh, so many American people died in this uh, virus, but uh, your country have a good medical equipment um and um, a good me uh, and a good uh, me uh, medical um drugs D drugs why they well, why they couldn't found a very good ways to treat them but i think the 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 biggest uh, the biggest problem for america is that People need to get together to overcome the the, the, the COVID-19. Yeah, the, the the situation is not that good, right? Because a lot of people died in this epidemic. Yeah, so I think now they need to help each other. They need to get together to overcome the difficulty. And maybe after that, they need to work more on development on economy maybe having seen firsthand how the response differed here from back home there's no question to me that cultural distinctions had at least some part in how the pandemic played out and some of my interview subjects agreed for example in China, uh, um, we have this kind of policy um you know uh sacrifice a, a small amount of people's interest to gain the best of the group but I think for for Westerners, for example, when I was in Denmark, they tested there is a new kind of COVID uh, virus in a uh, uh, kind of animal. Uh, but the the government decided to you know kill all these kind of animals to in order in order to uh, prevent the virus from spreading. Um, the Danish people were like super mad, and they are like this kind of thing is completely unreasonable because although we support you to kill this kind of animal um, it doesn't matter whether we agree or not it's you just you didn't follow the procedure you need to gain the majority of support from the government and then you can 
um, you know, can do this. Uh, thousand or more thousands of people they gather together to uh, say government did was wrong. So, but it at some point it actually make the pandemic just worse because when people gather together, it's really easy to spread the virus. And but what they care more about is the whether or not the procedure is justified, not the result. But for Chi- Chinese, maybe they you know pay more attention to whether the the result is justified rather than the procedure. There's one more factor that might explain the chilly reception towards the U.S., and it ties into another word that came up in several interviews. They should respect the Chinese traditional culture, and they should respect the Chinese law. Respect is hard to quantify, but important in understanding relations. We might call this reciprocity. The Chinese have a poor opinion of Americans because they perceive that Americans have a poor opinion of them. There's certainly a history of anti-Chinese sentiment in the West, going back to the century of humiliation and the yellow peril fears that followed the first wave of Chinese immigrants to the United States. Recently, I unearthed diaries from Albert Einstein show how even educated and enlightened Westerners could have shockingly derisive views of the Chinese. We're now past the age of yellow peril, and these days, views of Chinese Americans and Chinese immigrants are positive, if still stereotyped, befitting their status as the so-called model minority. Yet there are distinct differences between how Americans view Chinese people in America and Chinese people in China. And the people here are certainly aware of that. I, I've heard from many Americans that they, they have found Chinese people uh, kind of things critically, but it's not a true. It, 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 it's, it's more like Chinese people are more shy or more reserved than Americans. We usually hide, we usually keep the ideas to ourselves. I think when um, the American guy and the Chinese or the American person and the Chinese person uh, get um, get to know to know each other um, um, deeper and deeper, deep, more, more and more deeply, then the, uh, then the American guy, the American person may feel, oh, this Chinese person also has a lot of uh, critical uh, ideas, I mean, uh, different ideas from the government, different ideas from their parents. It's just, uh, we are very afraid of speaking uh, the, flow of, the flow of our mind. So where do we go from here? If Chinese and American views are bound up in media narratives, colored by ignorance and informed by complex history, then what are the chances that they will change, and what would it take? And now things may change because there is a new president. <laughs> oh yeah, there is that little change, isn't there? I, Joseph Robinette Biden Jr., do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute. That I will faithfully execute the office. But hold on, let's stop for a moment and go back. For while Chinese people may not necessarily hold state actions against individual Americans, what American officials say and do can certainly still affect their views. Reciprocity, remember. And for a period of two years, the same period in which American opinion of China slid so much. The man chiefly responsible for the China policy was U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, a notorious hawk and hardliner, and he was not shy about his opinions on China. Know that when you're approached by a Chinese diplomat, it is likely not in the spirit of cooperation or friendship. Know that if you're offered a trip to China when the pandemic travel restrictions restrictions are lifted, that you should ask who's paying for the trip, and if that person is linked. Directly or indirectly to the Chinese Communist Party. Indeed, last year, a Chinese government-backed think tank in Beijing produced a report that assessed all 50 of America's governors on their attitudes towards China. They labeled each of you friendly, hardline, or ambiguous. I'll let you decide where you think you belong. Someone in China already has. These are, these are. 
companies that were built on stealing American technology, bringing it back to the homeland, and then turning around and dumping it in the United States of America and around the world, and then bullying countries into accepting this technology. I think nations come to understand that when the Chinese show up and say that it's free, nothing could be further from the truth. They've now come. And there's more. Pompeo suggested that Chinese students were spies and wanted to limit the number admitted to the U.S. He accused China of fixing the WHO elections to install a sympathetic director general. And because of all of this and more, he became the first United States Secretary of State to be sanctioned by the Chinese government. But he's gone now, and there is a new administration, but even at this early date, there are signs that things won't change so quickly. Unlike other Trump policies, they plan to stick with much of Trump's pressure, including tariffs and sanctions. I also believe that um, uh, President Trump was right in taking uh, a tougher approach to China. Uh, I disagree very much with uh, the way that he went about it in a number of areas, but the basic principle was the right one, and I think that's actually helpful. What about the locals, though? Are the people here more optimistic or pessimistic about the future of Sino-American relations? <laughs> no, um, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> uh, maybe uh, we have different opinion about uh, politics policy. Uh, we have different um, uh, habits. habits. Um, I don't think so. Because, I mean, there is no prominent friend. There is no prominent enemy. Um, it actually, um, two countries people uh, want we have a good relationship. Uh, um, it's good for uh, two countries uh, Igno uh, to, uh, two countries' economic development uh, and uh, technology information the heat war. But if there really is a clash of cultures between China and the United States, then two questions naturally rise. How far apart are those cultures, and can they change? American culture is constantly in flux, changing in response to demography, technology, economics, and a hundred other small factors. But, rightly or wrongly, people tend to view Chinese culture as more grounded in tradition and stable. And uh, Chinese people put more uh, emphasis on harmony, and uh, uh, they like uh, calm and uh, uh, stable life. However, um, American, American people like a changeable life. Uh, and uh, like to try new things. What do we mean by culture, anyway? Most people will define culture in terms of visible things, like food or music or clothing. And those certainly are cultural aspects. But culture is also about something more subtle and pervasive, values. And understanding those values is critical. China has a long history of sinification, cultural conversion of peoples living within or near its borders. It's a big part of how the Han Chinese were able to reclaim the empire from the Mongolian Yuan dynasty. The Yuan rulers adopted so much of the Chinese culture that it diminished their ability to exert influence over their Mongol allies. And that was certainly about something much deeper than clothes. Academics have spent decades trying to quantify culture, but these researchers, being predominantly Westerners, tend to create Western-valued-centric models that may not be applicable to non-Western cultures. In the 1980s, they formulated a new model just for China, the Chinese Values Survey. This includes uniquely Chinese values, such as filial piety and the concept of saving face, as well as Confucian-derived traits such as thrift, purity, humility, and obedience. So, patriotism is a, is a very, very um, ancient and, um, and um, uh, very old um, uh, uh, tradition in China. So, in China, if, if someone uh, often criticizes the government, many people will think, oh, you are negative, you have negative energy. Um, unlike Americans, I think Americans often express your ideas uh, very, very, very directly, uh, not only about Chinese government, also, uh, but also about you have them as the 
about our tradition, we don't often uh, talk about our government in a very negative way, then you may be very confused about this. Why? So are Chinese people all cowards? Uh, do, do you always stay silent? Are you afraid of the government? So actually, it's not a, uh, it's not a just like uh, we are being, we are afraid of the government. It's like our, uh, 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 it's like our government and and and, our, and we have the emotional connections, very 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 strong emotional connections. So we feel ashamed to um, uh, criticize our government too often. But is there any sign that China's culture is shifting? I heard a lot of cautious optimism among the people with whom I spoke. Chinese culture will be more innovative and will be more tolerant, because uh, with the development of globalization, more foreigners come to China, right? And we also talk with people in other countries. We have trade with them, so we do a lot of things with them. So it will be more tolerant, I think. Um, now, as a younger generation, they will know more about the world, this world, and uh, different uh, um, opinion about the Chinese culture and um, foreign cultures. Uh, now we have internet and IT technology. We can learn something and uh, know something from the internet. Now the transportation is so popular, we can use them to visit this world, to know about them. Now, mm. um, well, at some point, I'm quite confident that um, Chinese culture will be more open and, uh, you know, uh, more tolerant in the future, you know, because, uh, for example, in my parents' generation, they are not very uh, diverse. They are not very, they don't tolerant for, for example, LGBTQ growth. And, but for our generation, we are more and more open to the, these kind of new things. And we are more open-minded and more diversified with all kinds of different groups. So I think Chinese culture, I think the, we will be, most of people will be more and more tolerant. It's a, like a big trend. There's one final question I asked everyone. On behalf of anyone planning the visit for a week or a year or more, what should we do to get along? Now, some foreigners come to China. Um, I think they are, they are so nice. We can get along well with them, I think. I think uh, foreigners could, uh, uh, should respect uh, traditional countries in China. Um, I think the basic rule for almost every Westerner is to understand the role in China. Uh, the, the role, not only the laws or the regulations, but also like the unspoken rules. I hope they live like this in their own country, uh, uh, make themselves uh, more comfortable, uh, uh, have more conversation with us. I think the Chinese Asian culture is very inclusive. Inclusive, yes. Uh, even though we have a different opinion, we can discuss, we can negotiate, and be friendly and kind. That's the first thing. And if you don't know anything, just to ask. We Chinese people are willing to help you, I think. There is an older Chinese saying, uh, you, depend, you depend on your parents at home, and you depend on your friends when you go out. So maybe Chinese friends can help you a lot.